In 2009, Tina Park became not only the first Korean American, but also the youngest woman to be elected to the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees. The LACCD is the largest community college district in the U.S. Tina Park oversaw the budgets of all the community colleges in L.A. County. She was recognized as an active and valuable member of the Board of Trustees during her four-year term. Tina Park was selected out of a total of 12 candidates nationwide to fill a position at the New York Stock Exchange in her final year of college. Currently, Tina Park works as an independent marketing consultant. She is not only actively involved in politics and economics, but also education and human rights. This week on Heart to Heart, we talk to Tina Park, a passionate Korean-American who's here to spread her message of working hard and volunteering for communities. We're here with the author of the new book, It's Now Just Live, Tina Park. Welcome to Heart to Heart. Welcome to Korea. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's a very nice studio here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Tina, how long has it been since you were back here in Korea? Actually, I've been going in and out of Korea the uh -huh. past few years often, quite okay. often. But it's actually my first winter in Korea. Ah. So when I first arrived, mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, it's freezing here. This is a mild winter. <laughs> we would call this a mild winter here This is here a mild winter? Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the first thing that you do when you do come back to Korea? What I do, um, I go eat tteokbokki. <laughs> <laughs> I love tteokbokki. You know uh -huh. the ones they sell outside? On the streets, yeah. On the the streets, like, yeah. Yes. You I can't love it. replicate that taste you overseas, cannot, can ever, you? ever, no. Okay. <laughs> Anywhere else, only in Korea. Okay. Yeah. So you're here to promote your new book, but mm -hmm. also, I mean, you came under the spotlight a couple of years back in 2009 when you were elected to the Board of Trustees of the Los Angeles Community College District. And you raised um, quite a lot of attention because you were not only the first Korean-American, but also the youngest woman to be, a board, to be elected to the board, right? Um, so... The Board of Trustees for the LA CCD might be a little bit unfamiliar to our viewers, especially our Korean viewers. So could you explain exactly what that entailed? Well, it's, um, it's a two-year university or two-year college. Uh -huh. It's a community college, which means it's for the community. And it allows anyone, what age or what nationality or what have you, who wants to learn and have like second or third or fourth or fifth chances in their life to mm -hmm. have an opportunity to study in uh, different vocational uh, studies mm -hmm. uh, within our district okay. or within community college system, which right. is nationwide, mm -hmm. of course. And recently, President Obama announced that he's going to allow everyone free mm -hmm. of community college th system. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be a huge, you know, plus for, you know, people who live in the United, United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what got you interested <clears throat> in education? Because I know that your major in university was not actually education, it was accounting, right? Right. So I majored in accounting mm -hmm. and I'm sure you read in the book, I'm sure you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, that I went to New York Stock Exchange right, right after college. And moving to Los Angeles, uh, when I did ha get the opportunity to run for the Board of Trustees, mm -hmm. there are seven members on the board. And at the time, we were building, renovating our school, mm -hmm. our district. Right. So uh, they wanted someone who has finance background because we had $6 billion just to renovate mm -hmm. and build uh, our campuses in our nine different colleges. So, you know, it's good to have someone who could see what's going on and who could read the financial records. Right. So I think that was a good stepping stone for me, for anything in my life, whatever mm -hmm. I decide to do, having that accounting experience. Right. It's a huge asset for mm -hmm. my career. But what about the whole election process? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you, I know that we've talked to quite a few politicians and they say they always enter a race because they think they're going to win. No one enters a race because they think they're going to lose or there's a chance that they might lose. And yet you must have been aware that if you were successful, you would be the first Korean American in like the 100 year history of Korean immigration to the US. And you would also be the youngest woman to be on the board. So 
What were your feeling going into this race? Actually, I didn't have much thoughts in the beginning, <laughs> meaning uh -huh. that I didn't have high hopes I'm going to be the winner, I'm going to be the first Korean American, mm -hmm. I'm going to be the first youngest female. I didn't really have that in the beginning because I wanted to be in the most humble campaign as possible and be mm -hmm. like, have the utmost friendly campaign that we wanted to mm -hmm. have. It was, we never tried to do like a negative campaign, try to hurt my opponent right. or anything like that. At the time, yes, uh, you know, uh, in, um, in America at the time, we're econom economically mm -hmm. very uh, slim and the taxes were ri raising high. Right. And I think people just wanted someone who had like financial background mm -hmm. and who could be, who could say they could be accountable for what they're spending and be transparent. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like my, one of, one of my um, speeches that I would say mm -hmm. when, I, when I go to my campaign trail. Right, and I understand your opponent was actually another woman as well. I mean, yes, she was mm -hmm. an African-American mm -hmm. woman and she was, uh, she was a lawyer at the time, labor lawyer, and she was heavily supported by the Democrats mm -hmm. and I was supported by the Republicans. Right. And it was kind of like the first win in the Republican Party to mm -hmm. actually have a candidate in that uh, office or mm -hmm. in that seat to be successful and have a victory. Mm -hmm. So when you heard the news that you had won, and especially because I hear in the primary that you were actually second, mm -hmm. but then to win in the general election, I can't imagine, what did you feel when you first got the news that you were expected to win or that you won? Well, of course I'm gonna feel <laughs> ecstatic. <laughs> uh, it, it was an amazing experience, uh -huh. of course, but like in the beginning, um, that was our strategy. We right. didn't go full on in the primary. Mm. And when we got to be the second, that, that's when we like focused on the campaign and worked really hard every day, night and day, working full on with volunteers mm -hmm. and whole staff. And that's how we were able to, you know, win our campaign. It mm -hmm. didn't come from one person. It didn't come from, you know, it came from a whole different amount of, you know, a lot of people in right. village and mm -hmm. community to, you know, have the success. And I owe everything to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after succeeding in the election, you came onto the board of trustees. It was a very powerful position. I know that um, it's related to a lot of policies and you have this amazing budget as well. So I think naturally the question that I have to ask is many consider being on the board of trustees of the LACCD as maybe a stepping stone or a springboard to maybe a next step in politics. So I know there was some talk about maybe you entering politics. Have you given that any more thought? Or? That's actually a good question because mm -hmm. even the current governor of California, uh -huh. Jerry Brown, he's from our board. Right. And uh, one of my good friend, Mike Antonovich, mm -hmm. he's the county supervisor, Los Angeles County supervisor, and he's from, he was from the Board of Trustees. Uh -huh. So it's definitely a good stepping stone. And even my colleagues at the time, now they're assembly members and, you know, they're running for city council, okay. a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, who's sitting on the board currently. Mm -hmm. And they're all running for either state office or citywide office. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's an amazing stepping stone to go to do another, to be in another office. But at the time, um, I had, you know, there's were a lot of good reasons why I didn't. And mm -hmm. even in the beginning when I was running, I was never planning on running again for the second term for that particular office. Right. And I didn't say that at the time because you can't really you can't say, say that. that no. um, but do I want to run again? I, I don't know. That's a question to be answered later <laughs> in the future. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned that when you were initially running in the, in the very first time, you weren't really thinking of going for the second term. And yet, because you did so well, I know that many people were hoping that you would run for re-election, and yet you didn't. Um, was there a point maybe during your term that you thought, huh, maybe I can go for a second term? Or why did you decide not to? So th again, that mm -hmm. becomes like very personal mm -hmm. and I would love to share it with you guys and I will, I guess, <laughs> since you keep asking me that question. <laughs> and it obviously talks about it in my book. Um, I w never was going to run, mm -hmm. but again, like my father had passed away the mm -hmm. same year that I was supposed to re-seek my, my, mm -hmm. my seat. 
And uh, when my father passed away, that was which is was on October, mm -hmm. and um, and I was supposed to make the decision in early December, mm -hmm. and I just had to really consider like my family and you know myself. That right. was like the first and most priority in my life, mm -hmm. and uh, everything else comes after, mm -hmm. and you know like money come and go, you know, friends come and go, and even, you know, your f fame or what have you come and go. And, but your family and yourself will always be there. And you have to be true to yourself mm -hmm. about what happens in your life and what goes on in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think I was just really being true to myself and I needed the time mm -hmm. to kind of take care of myself and my family. Mm -hmm. So no regrets. Absolutely no regrets. Okay. Well, at the age of 33, Tina Park became the first Korean American and the youngest woman to be elected to the Board of Trustees of the LACCD. We'll take a look now at the confidence and passion that helped her get there right after this. I have a great experience, like if I think about it, like great memories and you know, a good experiences that I did learn while I was working there. Mm -hmm. So I'm like always grateful for that experience and to the people there, yeah. Having achieved so much at a young age, one might be forgiven to think that Tina Park has never really encountered any difficulties, but she says she also had to go through some very painful lessons. Of course, of everyone has, but one of the moments that you mentioned um, that you were proudest of while serving on the Board of Trustees of the LACCD is when you managed to get August 15th officially recognized as the Korean Independence Celebration Day. So in Los Angeles, I mean, we know that there's a huge Korean community there, but for all nine colleges to officially recognize and also celebrate Korean Independence Day, that must have been quite a feat. And quite difficult to persuade the other members as well. How did you go about doing this? Um, well, mm -hmm. August 15th is our liberation day of Korea. And everybody knows with what happened and why we have that date. And it's part of our history. And I wanted to acknowledge and kind of remember and also kind of influence other Korean Americans mm -hmm. that lives in California or United States that you know, we should be proud to be Korean, Korean and we should never forget our roots and we should never forget where we come from. Like because of our country is alive, mm -hmm. we're able to say who we are proudly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I was coming from to acknowledge or recognize and pass the resolution for August 15th as the Korean Liberation Day. Mm -hmm. You're obviously very proud of your Korean heritage and in the swearing in ceremony for your position, at the very end, you said that you wanted to be a voice and you wanted to empower Koreans in your community. I know that you left Korea when you were just six years old. Um, how did you maintain, I mean, did you not sometimes feel distant from Korea? Because I know that a lot of my friends who moved abroad when they were very young, they, you know, they grew up with American friends or Canadian friends, and they almost kind of lose touch with their sort of traditional roots. But did that never happen for you? I guess it all depends on your upbringing. Mm -hmm. And my parents had taught me never forget where you come from mm -hmm. and always kind of tell me like stories of you know, during when they were young and how they grew up right. and how my grandparents grew up and during, uh, even during the Japanese invasion when my grandfather was actually growing up at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's from my family always like talking to me about Korea right. and how I should always remember mm -hmm. Korea as my homeland mm -hmm. and never to forget where you come from and always remember your roots. So I think that allowed me to also, going back to the question that you asked me earlier mm -hmm. about August 15th as, right. as passing the resolution for the Korean Liberation Day, mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of acknowledging you know, my roots. Mm -hmm. 
Before you moved out to the West Coast, LA, um, you were at the New York Stock Exchange, and also you were the first Korean to join the audit department, I hear, of of the New York Stock Exchange. And at the time. At the time, right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, you were chosen out of 12 candidates in all of the U.S. So again, this is quite a feat as well. How did you come about this position? Well, I'm sure every college graduates go through this process. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, same with every other companies, you know, you go through campus recruiting and to the main office. Mm -hmm. And I, if I remember correctly, I think there were like a couple hundred s students that did apply for the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. And a handful of us got into for the second round interview mm -hmm. uh, to the main office, which was, which is in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And out of, from, from that, I think I'm the on I was the only one that got selected from my school. Right. And it was 12 nationwide. So it was a huge accomplishment at the time. And uh, it's still, I, f I have uh, great experience, like mm -hmm. if I think about it, like great memories mm -hmm. and, you know, a good experiences that I did learn mm -hmm. while I was working there. Mm -hmm. So I'm like always grateful for that experience and to the people there. Yeah. So very competitive field mm -hmm. and you managed to get this coveted job. So just kind of veering off the main topic there, but how did you prep for this interview? And did you kind of feel like after each, each interview that, yes, I aced it, I did it, a great job. How did you prepare? How did you get ready for this interview? I think my university, mm -hmm. I went to Hofstra mm -hmm. and uh, we had like seminars to prep for interviews. and. I would attend all those seminars and really try to uh, pr prepare myself for a any interview. That so I did the other hundreds of students, right? I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know. But uh -huh. it's like the eager mm. that you want mm. to, to do and, you, the, you know, the outcome that mm -hmm. you, wa you want to receive and you want right. to prep yourself really well. And I think e even during those uh, seminars, we learn how to, you know, be in a dinner table and how to use your fork and knife. It started from that wow. to uh, the way you speak and mm -hmm. the eye contact is mm -hmm. very important. And I think ultimately uh, my acceptance at NYC was a sense of humor and mm -hmm. my volunteer work oh. uh, during my college years. So okay. I think they highly uh, recognize mm -hmm. uh, my volunteer work. And I was, yeah, I think that's what really helped me get in because like the GPA and the scores and all of that are pretty much all the same around because there's you know requirements you right. need to have mm -hmm. in order to even apply. Yeah. So it's kind of like the same people, same students and same scores. What but, sets you apart? But what, yeah. Right, but what did, what did you do for the community? Mm -hmm. What other things other than your scores did you give mm -hmm. to, to be where you are mm -hmm. now? And I think that was what I was different than anyone else. Okay, so after this very competitive selection process, you landed a wonderful job. It kind of seems like you would be set for life, and yet you left it all behind and you went west. Why? Uh, you're actually on the dot on that because like when I went there and worked, my directors and VPs, they work, they've been there for 20 to 30 years. So it, yeah, it is a lifelong career mm -hmm. at the New York Stock Exchange. Pretty cushy and, too, right? Uh, very, <laughs> very. And the environment is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was good times while I was there. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of things happened during my years at mm -hmm. the NYSE, and one of the biggest event or traumatic experience that uh, happened was 9-11, mm -hmm. and I happened to be in the building. And after going through that, right. you kind of you know, wonder a lot of things about life. Mm -hmm. And the traumatic experiences that you just went through will not just fade away overnight. And it, and it didn't for me. And how he, it would haunt me. <laughs> uh, and what what's great about NYSC, they gave uh, like counseling after mm -hmm. that experience. Um, I should have taken that counseling. Oh, you didn't take it? <laughs> I, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, and I thought I was gonna be okay mm. thinking because I, I, you know, I'm such a hard worker, mm -hmm. and always, tr and then I shared a lot of my stories with my family, mm -hmm. but obviously it wasn't enough. Right. And um, 
I just needed kind of like a break from all the chaos and the whole city mm. every day. I don't know if you've been to New York, it's I quite have, hectic. Yeah. And even my mornings, you know, I put my shoes in my bag and I'm wearing my mm -hmm. sneakers to taking subways to my work and I would change my shoes. Right. When I get to work, it was, and you know, I just needed some, a new scenery, a mm -hmm. new environment. Mm -hmm. And LA was just the best thing that was for me, that was for me. <laughs> and it was the best decision for me, mm -hmm. actually. Okay, we'll talk about that whole experience in a little bit. So Tina Park recently published a collection of essays called It's Now, Just Live. And it describes some of the challenges that she faced in the US, as well as all the hard work she put into to get to where she is today. We'll take a look at how Korean readers have responded to her book right after this. This past January, a talk celebrating the release of Tina Park's collection of essays was held at the National Assembly Building in Seoul. Politicians, members of the press, the medical community, the nonprofit sector, and various other fields gathered to participate in the talk. During the talk, Tina Park had an honest discussion with the panel and readers in the audience, discussing her values, her involvement in volunteering, and her love for her native country while never shying away from touching on the hardships that she's experienced. At an early age, Tina Park accomplished a great deal, and we look forward to watching her bright future continue to unfold. I'm here with Tina Park, whose contributions to society have made her a role model to many young people. I know that a lot of people who have met you, and I feel the same way, are just kind of struck by your positive energy, you seem very bright and you're very communicative as well. Have you always been sort of this very optimistic and positive person or is it something that you also try to consciously project for the public image? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm for real, very positive person. <laughs> My father, mm -hmm. uh, when, when uh, starting from my younger years, he was a very positive and optimistic person, and mm -hmm. that's how he raised me. Okay. So I remember, like, I would tell him, oh, I want to be, like, a teacher when I grow up, and he would be like, yes, you could do whatever you want mm -hmm. that you put your mind to. And then the next day I would be like, okay, then I want to be a doctor. He's like, okay. <laughs> and the next day I'll be like something some totally different. Uh -huh. And um, he's like, okay. Well, he never said no of anything that I would ask him. He's mm -hmm. like, you could do whatever you want. What about your mom? My mom is also very really? positive too. Wow. Okay. But I think the, the energy that I got was definitely from my father's mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he, he was, he's a very, very, uh, uh, a sweet father mm -hmm. that I, you know, I, I, when he passed away, it was like the most dev devastating thing, of course, that I had to go through. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, I got it from his upbringing. Mm -hmm. Now the the book, it's now just live. Um, I know that this was written, I think, during a painful period for you. So writing the book, you have described it as quite therapeutic for you as well. Could you describe the whole situation, why you decided to write it, and what the process was like? So the reason, I guess, uh, I wanted to dedicate something for my father after his death. And mm. I, there was always uh, people asking me to write a book since my 2009 election mm -hmm. and kind of talk about my election and 
talk about my community work, uh, the, the, uh, public service uh, after. And um, I'm such a private person. Like, yes, I want to work and do my job as a public figure. Right. But when I go home, I'm very much private. Mm -hmm. And when I meet my friends, I'm also very much private. So kind of opening myself or my life to the world was not easy for me. But when, after my father passed away, uh, um, it was definitely, uh, uh, I didn't know how I should, um, I don't know, kind of remember him mm -hmm. and kind of even admit that he passed away. Like, it was very hard for me to, you know, move on after his mm -hmm. passed. And I think it took me a really long time to get there. Okay. Uh, and when I did, um, that's when it, it allowed me to kind of do something for my dad and let me write a book and kind of and dedicate to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you said that he was very positive and mm -hmm. he always encouraged you to follow your dream no matter mm -hmm. how many times your dream changed. Did he also influence you in, in giving back to society and yes. wanting to do that? How so? Well, that was kind of who he was. Mm -hmm. And he was a pastor and then eventually he had a theology seminary uh -huh. college. And, and during his tenure and during his work, uh, he always found a way to give back to his community, mm -hmm. which could be his church, mm -hmm. could be his Korean community, or it could be in a different country supporting mm -hmm. his cause or his faith. Mm -hmm. um, so I always got that from him, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, at such a young age, right. and kind of seeing that from your parents and even my mom is very even till now she mm -hmm. works a lot for the Korean community in Los Angeles and also in Korea mm -hmm. and um, having those two proud parents uh, I have to kind of follow their steps in a way mm -hmm. and that kind of became my dream as well to eventually um, be you know, humanitarian or philanthropy mm -hmm. in, in that sort. Um, going on to a sort of a painful memory for you, and I know that it was um, a moment that kind of changed your life. Um, I'm sure there'll be other sort of turning points, but one, of course, was the 9-11 attack, and you were in that building. Um, I've heard you recount the story in another interview and also in your book, of course, but for those of us who have not heard that, could you tell us or could you go through that day? I know it's still painful, but can you go through what happened for you that day? Actually, um, if, I, if I would go on before, like mm -hmm. when people asked me about that day, it was mm -hmm. very hard for me to okay. describe it. Uh -huh. But what I was saying in my book, that what I learned through my experiences, mm -hmm. the more you share, the more healing you get. Mm -hmm. And I think through sharing, now I'm okay to share okay. about that day. and. Um, you know, it happened and you have to accept it and you just have to move on. Mm -hmm. So if I talk a little about that day, it was the morning, it was a Tuesday morning mm -hmm. and um, I, same work day, you wake up, you get ready to go to work and my train that was going to the World Trade Center mm -hmm. was the last train that stopped that morning mm -hmm. because of the attack. Wow. So when I was coming out of the train, Everybody was like kind of running. Mm -hmm. So I had to literally, you know, lean against the wall so I don't get stepped on. And mm -hmm. I was like, what is going What's on? Going I was on? like looking around like, what is going on? Now you didn't work there, but you were there on business or work. Yes, related, we had a right? meeting mm -hmm. with Bank of New York mm -hmm. and I was supposed to be there for that meeting. And um, I had to stop this gentleman and say, what is going on? And people in the building thought it was a bomb because of what happened. Mm -hmm back in, you know, when there was a bomb. Mm -hmm. So we, no one even thought Imagine, it could yeah. be a plane that hit the building. Mm -hmm. And so we're slowly walking out of the building at the time, but the security at first did not allow anyone to mm -hmm. get out of the building because there were still bricks falling. There was still stuff falling from, from the building. And you were Tower the, One, right? The, the first from building. From Tower One, uh -huh. this was Tower One. 
And so I'm slowly going out of the building and I look down and there's a lot of bricks and there's mm -hmm. like like falling paper, like snow mm -hmm. paper, mm -hmm. like it's like rain, right. like all these paper from sky. And I look up and I see an object mm -hmm. and it's falling closer to me. And I'm like, what is that object? And I'm looking closer to see what that object is. And the object starts to move. Oh. And it was some it was person, person mm -hmm. that jumped and I just, you know, move my head and I look away. Um, and at that time, I literally froze mm. and I couldn't think and I couldn't move and I, I didn't know what to do. I knew that the building would fall eventually and I could see that, mm -hmm. that it would, it's going to fall. Like it's in my head, yeah. but I still couldn't move and I didn't know what to do. So I think this is where their emergency uh, staff, like, the fireman, mm -hmm. like the police officer, that's just the key for them to come in to help those people who right. are just frozen in shock, in shock. Yeah. you know, who, do, who don't, doesn't know what to do. So then that happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, so it was from my team members who was with me going to the meeting. Mm -hmm. They helped me kind of evacuate. Mm -hmm. And that really saved my life. Mm. Some of your colleagues or people that you had worked with were still in the building, I imagine? Yes. So they if you met their. Away. Yeah. And you said that the NYSE had offered um, counseling, counseling after. afterwards, and yet you decided not to take it. <laughs> I don't quite understand. I mean, you were there, you had seen it all. I, the trauma, the shock that you were in. Um, you said that you thought that the hard work, your just attitude would, would want, see, get you through it. <laughs> Was this a bit naive or? Um, How did you cope? Because of the guilt that I had of being alive and having a couple of our friends that passed away mm -hmm. and having a lot of people that mm -hmm. passed away um, during that tragedy, I didn't think it was okay for me to get counseling. I thought, how dare you get counseling? Like, you should be thankful that you're even alive. Mm -hmm. And honestly, for a few days, I thought I should just die because they did. Mm -hmm. And I felt guilty of being alive. And I think it's, it was really hard for me to admit that and even share this with how I was feeling with my, even with my family, mm -hmm. but you know, I think time heals <laughs> and mm -hmm. now I'm okay to talk about it. Um, but it was, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a easy decision of, okay, I'm going to feel better now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go take counseling right. because you know what? There are people who died. Yeah. I'm not going to take counseling. Maybe I you thought that other people needed right. it more than right. you did. Right. Or, or, mm. you know what? I should be happy. I should be, you know, I should, I shouldn't, complain of mm. what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then you moved west, and I imagine this also Not right away, but... Not right away. Not right away, but a mm -hmm. couple years How, after. A couple years afterwards, yeah. okay. How long do you think it took for you to finally accept what had happened, that you don't have to feel guilty, that you felt okay about talking about this experience? I think the guilt part, mm -hmm. uh, I got out of it, like, quite fast, mm -hmm. but... It was hard for me to even look at, you know, those photos yes. that it's like it was everywhere mm. after the ground event, uh -huh. the ground zero, like the plane and the, I mean, the building and the plane going in, you know, that yes. picture, yes. That, the, the picture that everybody uses. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I hated that picture. Mm. Like I would go to work and not my office, but like other, you know, I was an auditor, so I would right. go to other offices and mm -hmm. they have those photo. I'm like, I don't understand. Why do you have this photo here? Mm. Um, I, I couldn't, that was hard for me to look at. It was like, it was hard for me to watch like 9-11 events. It was hard for me to look at photos from back then. Mm -hmm. I think it lasted about eight years. Wow. Yeah, a long time. Mm -hmm. Back in 2009, when SBS came and mm -hmm. we were doing a documentary about like my life in Los Angeles and they followed me for like a week. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to talk about 9-11, and I said, I cannot. Mm. And still too raw. Yeah, it was, and it was, what, how many years after from 2001? Mm. It was still eight years after from 2001, but it was still very hard for me. Mm. I think after the 10-year mark, mm -hmm. I was better to talk about it. And 
definitely writing the book definitely. helped me mm -hmm. heal. Yes. So let's talk a little bit more about the book then. Uh, you describe seven ways or seven secrets that people can change their lives. Um, some of them include a positive outlook, having a positive outlook, passion, volunteering, so on. All of it from personal experience, I imagine. One of the seven secrets, though, is that people should be sensitive to opportunities. Seems a bit cryptic. We, I kind of think I know what that means, but what do you mean exactly? So when I was writing that uh, subject mm -hmm. or that topic, um, it wasn't really for business. It was more for meeting people, like relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working as a public figure and meeting so many people every day, you meet hundreds and hundreds of people all the time. Or, you know, you meet personal, like acquaintances and, and, and friends and mm -hmm. what have you. There's so many people that we meet yes. every day, right? And what I, from my experience, what I learned was don't take granted for your relationships and the people that come to your life, mm -hmm. small or big, always praise who you meet and, you know, appreciate. And I had to learn it the hard way. And there are some, you know, acquaintances or friends that I would love to kind of reconnect. And, you know, things happen in life and you kind of disconnect and you don't talk to them anymore. But mm -hmm. it kind of talks about that sensitivity mm -hmm of the opportunity of meeting people. Okay. That's what it talks about. You said about. you had to learn the hard way about being sensitive to opportunities, about being sensitive to the people that you meet. Give us an example. Um, well, there's a lot of examples. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I had to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. It could be from teachers to students, like from, you know, back in when I was college that I don't speak to anymore and I don't even know how to go upon to mm -hmm. reconnect with them or from friends that you know come and go and there what well, uh, there are a couple of friends that I do remember that uh, that you know maybe I was a bit naive where I said oh maybe we shouldn't be friends anymore and kind of took them for granted at the time mm -hmm. and lost their friendship and those times, if I think about, are where I should have been sensitive and kind of give people more chances, you know. Mm -hmm. And now when I do meet people, I would never, you know, kind of have a, like a wall in between a relationship. Mm -hmm. Always try to be open. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, things happen in life for them as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to be understanding mm -hmm. and, and, and appreciate for who they are and love for who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad I learned it the hard way because now whoever I meet, mm -hmm. um, I think it's wonderful. And, and, you know, I hope that I have their friendship for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a part in your book where you say that more uncertain your youth is, more beautiful it is. It kind of reminded me of another sort of bestseller who said, Apunika <laughs> um, you hurt because you're young. So uh, it was sort of, it's a nice message, but to youth, I'm not sure how much comfort they take in that. Yes, you know, everyone talks about how they were uncertain and they didn't know what they wanted to do in their 20s, but they were grateful for that time in their lives. So I know that you've met with a lot of university students and young people during your stay here. What advice, more maybe concrete advice, do you give them? who are faced with so many uncertainties about their future. What sort of advice do you give them? Um, I say that being uncertain mm -hmm. uh, is the good times, and you have to think that it's the good time because it's very unpredictable. And being unpredictable is definitely not comfor comforting. Mm -hmm. However, being unpredictable gives equals also that there's so much open to possibilities. So unpredictable mm -hmm. equals possibilities. So uncertainty also equals possibilities. Right. And you should be grateful for that. And don't think, okay, I'm, it's unpredictable and it's so uncertain, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Think of it as, I have so many possibilities. What should I do? What mm -hmm. do I wanna do? Okay. 
How have the students been taking that advice? They love it. They love and it. And I want to encourage them. But uh, again, it's the society and the family that they grew up in. It's do this, do that. It's like constantly what they tell me. It's like the constant mm -hmm. like pressure that they get from mm -hmm. the society or the family that they're in. And um, I said, you know what? You have to, it's your life. It's not anyone else's life. It's your life. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide what you want to do. And you have to be happy because no one else can make you happy except for yourself. Well, as Tina Park says, the uncertainty of youth is what makes it so beautiful. And our cameras followed along on a meeting with young Korean students. Let's take a look. Tina Park is giving a talk late one evening. It's the first one she's ever held with high school students, so she carefully examines the topics of the night one more time. When I was in college, or even before when I was in college, when I was in high school, when I was trying to apply to college, so I'm gonna probably focus on those times, like how it's common, what they're going through, Respect and pride in her work has helped Tina Park get to where she is today. How are you? You almost class How are you, everybody? Good. 사실 내 자신이 내가 성공했어라고 하면 성공한 거야. 그러니까 내가 내 자신을 어떻게 생각하느냐가 제일 중요해요. She reassures the students who are feeling uncertain about their futures that uncertainty is a sign of being alive and being free to make your own choices. <laughs> high schoolers, students about to enter high school, and those repeating their senior year are all busy studying for the college entrance exams. But at least for the duration of the talk, their anxieties are eased. Thanks to Tina Park's honest and realistic advice. Thank you. I just want to tell the students today that I met to have faith in themselves. And no matter what happens in life, it's what matters the most. It's you and yourself, and how you think about yourself, and what you think about yourself. 이번에 선생님 조언 같은 거 듣고 되게 많은 생각을 한게된것된것 같아서 되게 감사했습니다. 많은 교훈되는 말 했으니까 이제 앞으로도 이렇게 살면 좀더 나아지지 않을까라는 생각도 하게 되고 좋았던 시간이었던 것 같습니다. The students feel strengthened by Tina Park's positive attitude. For her, uncertainty is part of the beauty of life and it's what allows her to continue choosing a life full of challenges. So that was Tina Park giving some very honest advice to young students. We will now continue our conversation with the author, Tina Park. So you're an author, but right now I understand what you're most busy with is providing humanitarian aid to minority groups in the Middle East, is that right? <laughs> Kind of I would, education I would, <laughs> and a different. Well, I wouldn't altogether. say that I'm most busy is okay. is on that. Um, I last year, sometime mm -hmm. last year, I was invited to this event, and I absolutely had no idea what I was getting into when I was going to this event. It was a friend of mine who invited me, and uh, when I was there. Uh, they were showing video clips and photograph, and it just shocked me. Uh, it was a photograph of the IS mm -hmm. uh, terrorists uh, killing uh, the minorities in Iraq mm -hmm. at the time. And at the time, it was not even showing it, it on the news in the U.S. Like No one was aware of anything, what was going on in Iraq at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was very few people who kind of first had experience of okay. what was going on in Iraq and 
uh, I went home after the event and I couldn't sleep for like a week. And um, um, I didn't even know if I could help them. They were asking to support, let's spread the awareness because obviously it's not on the news even. Mm -hmm. And it's going on in Iraq, and, and people you've done are some stuff. marketing activities and, and consulting is in your uh, expertise in that area. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I, you know, at first I didn't know what I could do okay. for them, and then eventually, you know, I thought of like, okay, then let's throw a campaign, and let's gather people, let's do a rally, mm -hmm. and let's do a campaign for the awareness of what's going on in Iraq, since not a lot of people are talking about it right now. And if we could uh, get some funds for them, because they're in need, in need of the funds. And this was like last May when I first attended this event. So imagine how a lot of people are getting into it now yeah. after all these months. Right. Um, but that's how I kind of started with the campaign and uh, eventually it led to working with the UN, kind mm -hmm. of asking for their uh, humanitarian aid and kind of giving them like a safe heaven of uh, the, the victims in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now you could see like even a lot of celebrities is coming out and supporting them and help asking people to donate for them. But it's kind of unfortunate how it's been going on for so long and how like not a lot, a lot of media were talking about, and there are so many people that already mm -hmm. are dead and, and, and suffering. And um, it's just absolutely a, a catastrophe mm. as, as for human. Right. So, um, but yeah. better late than never, hopefully. And there is so much yeah. attention on this now that, um, and you helped bring awareness to it. Um, I did want to go back to one more point in your book, and I think it's a major point, the volunteering part. Um, you've mentioned that I think it's your father's influence as well. How have you tried to constantly bring that into your life and I imagine that you'll continue to do going forward? I guess it started again, like mm -hmm. starting when I was really little and at soup kitchens mm -hmm. to uh, when I was in college, I did like uh, awareness and also uh, a, a, a fundraiser for the homeless mm -hmm. shelters in New York City at okay. the time because it was the coldest winter and a lot of people on the streets were dying because of the weather. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did like a concert, a mini concert um, and 100% of the proceeds went to the homeless shelters mm -hmm. in, in New York City at the time. And like one step at a time, you know, it's like you don't have to give everything in the beginning, just like an hour or two a week. It starts from that to however hours you want to give. Mm -hmm. Or if you have finance that you could share, then, you know, donate. You know, it's, it's like there's so many ways you could participate uh, in volunteering. And I encourage everybody because everybody needs support. You know, and I think it's a good helping hand mm -hmm. now and then. It's, it's a good spirit overall. And what does it do for you as a volunteer? What do you think it brings to the person who's actually doing the volunteering? Uh, it's the feeling that you get after you know that you did something for someone and the cause that you really care for. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings like miracles to your life. And I learned so much throughout, through my volunteer work. And you know, if I could do more, I'll be happy. It's just sometimes, you know, you, you just can't because of the situation. And that's fine, too. But whatever you can give, I think it's, it's good. Just one more question. Because you're coming back and forth from Korea and you've released your book here in Korea, any plans to become more active here in Korea or some other projects or work-related stuff? I think there's always work in Korea. <laughs> So, uh, sure, everything is, you know, mm -hmm. everything could be handled. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're leaving your possibilities and the, the, the options out there? The possibility is definitely there. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for coming on Heart to Heart and best of luck on your new book and your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And that was Tina Park, author of It's Now Just Live. Thank you so much for joining us here on Heart to Heart. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>